Welcome to this video in the matter unit. In this video, we are going to cover properties and changes of matter. Following this lesson, you should be able to define the terms physical and chemical property and identify examples of each. You should also be able to identify and distinguish between physical and chemical changes. In order to be ready to do that, make sure you've printed out this video's companion worksheet. You're going to want to complete that as you watch the video and definitely bring it with you to class tomorrow since that's what I'll be checking as your homework. Make sure you take notes on any and all content presented in this video since this is your lesson which you're going to be using later on to study for the chapter test. Remember if anything happened too quickly you can always pause and rewind the video to make sure that you get everything that is being presented and if anything is unclear make sure that you take note of that and ask about it in the burning questions segment tomorrow in class. So without any further ado let's get started. You're probably wondering why I included a picture of bamboo to start this video which is supposed to be about properties of matter. The reason is simple we're going to talk about some of the physical properties of bamboo. First, some history. Bamboo, which belongs to a family of grasses, grows both in temperate and tropical regions. It grows like a weed, both rapidly and to great heights. And actually, here in the river towns, bamboo has been outlawed and can no longer be planted because it is such an invasive species. Now, back to properties. Because it is so inexpensive and readily available, people use the bamboo stems to make a bunch of different products. From furniture, to fishing rods, to flooring, to one of my favorites, bambusa, which incidentally is not as soft as Charmin, to the ubiquitous chopsticks, which are seen in many sushi restaurants. The properties of bamboo make it ideal to use in manufacturing. Let's take those chopsticks, for example. Chopstick makers observed and leveraged the physical properties of bamboo. Upon examination, they found that bamboo has no noticeable odor or taste, is hard yet splits easily, and is incredibly heat resistant. Perfect for an eating utensil. Properties of matter in chemistry can be synonymous with the way the chopstick makers use properties of matter in their investigation of bamboo. For us, Knowledge of properties can be useful in distinguishing between different substances, characterizing or classifying, or, like the chopstick makers, understanding usability. There are going to be two types of properties we're going to study over the next couple of minutes. They are physical properties and chemical properties. Let's start with physical. By definition, physical properties are characteristics of matter that are observed and described through the use of your five senses. Take the sporting equipment here, for example. We can use our five senses to really make a lot of observations about what we're seeing. The basketball is a sphere. The basketball is rough. The basketball is orange. The hockey puck is hard. The hockey puck is smooth on top and rough on the sides. Physical properties can also be observed through the use of a measuring tool. The internal temperature of the hamburger is about 160 degrees. The length of the shoe is about 9 inches. The mass of the gold is about 66.4 grams. In all three of these cases, our observations are aided through the use of some scientific measuring tool. Now, what makes something truly a physical property has to do with the chemical composition of the object that we are observing, both before and after the observation is made. When a property is physical, the chemical composition of whatever the item is that you are observing remains the same after the observation is made. So it is identical before and after the observation. Some examples of physical properties are color, density, odor, texture, mass, volume. Basically anything that you are measuring or observing with your five senses is a physical property. Now what about the melting point of an object? Is that a physical property? Well, we have to examine what's going on. Let's take iron for instance. Iron comes out of the ground as a solid, but in manufacturing, in order to use it, we want to smelt the iron, which really means we're taking it and we're inducing a phase change from solid to liquid through the addition of heat. 
the melting point of iron is about 2800 degrees Fahrenheit. Is the melting point of iron a physical property? Well, how do we observe melting point? You're right. We're going to use a thermometer. And we found out that it's about 2800 Fahrenheit. Now, when we made that observation with the thermometer, have we changed the chemical composition of iron? That's a good question. And the answer is no, we haven't. Even though we have changed the phase, which has to do with the arrangement of the particles, iron, assuming no impurities, is still iron atoms at its most basic level. It's simply just the arrangement that's changed through the addition of heat when we take it from a solid to a liquid. So be careful. Remember, anytime we are measuring a melting point or even a boiling point for that matter, those are physical properties. Chemical properties describe the ability of a substance to undergo a specific chemical change and really only reveal themselves during or after a chemical reaction. Let's take this car for instance. What do we notice about it? Well, you're right. It's rusted. The ability to rust is a chemical property of iron. Well, what does that really mean? Well, if you think about it, we are actually describing iron's behavior and its behavior to undergo a reaction. As we see down here in this reaction, iron is combining with oxygen to make iron 3 oxide. This is something called a product, and this is different than the iron that's here. Iron here was alone, but now it's combined with something else. We've essentially made something new. So really, a chemical property only reveals itself when there's a chemical reaction that occurs, and you can clearly see the changes, though sometimes the changes are much harder to see. Let's take the Statue of Liberty, for example. I bet you've never seen it like this, but this is the way the Statue of Liberty looked in about 1886 when it first came over and was built by France. As we all know, the Statue of Liberty is made of copper. And this is how we know the Statue of Liberty today. It's nice and green. Well, one of the chemical properties of copper is that it reacts readily with oxygen to make that green coating that's there that's really copper oxide. So in a nutshell, a chemical property will always describe the potential to undergo a chemical change in the presence of another substance or energy. What we like to say sometimes is that chemical properties describe the behavior of matter. So its characteristics, really their behavior. For instance, we know that zinc will react vigorously in an acid. Gasoline is flammable, but apple juice is not, even though they sort of look the same. Baking soda creates a colorless gas when mixed with vinegar. We're talking about the way all these things will behave when in the presence of another object. One of my favorites, a balloon of hydrogen has the potential to ignite and explode given those right conditions. Here is a chart which has a comparison of physical and chemical properties of various substances. It would probably be a good idea to jot this down in your notes so you can have it to reference when you're studying for your next test. Okay, stop the video now and let's check for understanding. Use the notes that you just took and the knowledge you just gained to complete sections A, B, and C on your companion worksheet. Then hit play for the answers. If you got anything wrong, please make a note of it. And if you still don't understand it, make sure you ask about it in the burning questions segment tomorrow. The second half of this video deals with changes in matter, specifically physical changes versus chemical changes. When we're dealing with change, matter can change in two ways, either in its appearance or its identity. If we're looking at this example that we have here below, one of these changes is an alteration in simply the appearance of matter. One of them is an alteration in the identity. And you have to look closely at the particles to know what's happening. Take a guess on which change is which. If you guessed that the top one was a physical change and the bottom was chemical, you would be correct. Let's delve into why that is and go a little bit deeper into the two types of changes. We're going to start with physical changes. By definition, physical changes are changes or alterations to the form of a chemical substance, but not its chemical composition. Let's take this pizza, for instance. If we were to cut this pizza up into eight pieces, we're simply changing its form. 
we are not changing anything about the pizza. All of the properties of the pizza wind up being the same. On a molecular level, we haven't changed anything, but we have changed simply the form of the pizza. Take this paper, for instance. If we physically change this paper, how could we do it? Well, we certainly could cut it up into strips. We'd be changing or altering the form that we experience the paper. Could we still write on it? Could we still crumple it up? Could we still burn it? Absolutely. We really haven't changed anything on a molecular level of this paper. If we cut it up into tiny pieces like this, we still wouldn't have changed anything on a molecular level. We are really just changing the appearance of the paper. So we find after a physical change is made, that substance is always going to retain all of the properties that it previously had simply because we have not altered it on a molecular level. We have only altered its appearance or its form. The composition essentially remains the same. It may wind up being smaller, but that's it. Let's take dissolving, for instance. Is dissolving a physical change? Well, let's think about the rules that we've set forth that tell us whether something is a physical change or not. And let's now apply it to the solubility of salt. Now, if we were to dissolve salt in water, what's really happening? Are we making something new or are we simply changing the appearance of our substance? Well, you got to go to a molecular level in order to really know what's happening. And if we take a look at this and these two boxes that are here, here's salt in its crystalline lattice form, here's water, and then here's our solution of salt water. It looks to me like we still have all the same original pieces that we had before. So really, dissolving is, in fact, a physical change. It is simply mixing up the particles into solution, and we're not creating anything new. There's no chemical reaction that's occurring, which, as you guys will see in a little bit, is an indicator of a chemical change. One of the neat things that we find is that some physical changes can be reversed. Take the salt water, for instance. We know that we could recover the salt if we wanted simply by boiling off the water. So that would be a reversible physical change. But there are some physical changes that you can't reverse. For instance, if we were to simply cut our hair like this, we could not reverse the terrible haircut that we just gave this poor guy that's here. So be careful when you guys are, are analyzing your physical changes. What about phase change? Would phase change be a physical change as well? Well, let's apply the rules. Are we changing the identity of something or are we changing just its physical form? In order to really think about this, let's take water. We got to go down to a molecular level to see what's happening. This is our water that's here. You guys should all remember this from biology. You can see that when we do have a phase change, we are simply just changing the form that we are experiencing water in. We are altering only its appearance, only its arrangement. We are not altering it on a chemical level. We still see that water is these two little hydrogens here and that one oxygen. So don't be that guy. Remember that any phase change is simply a physical change. It's a change in the appearance and not a change in the composition. Whether you have ice, whether you have liquid water, or you have steam, water in its gaseous phase, it's still H2O. So in summary, physical changes only affect the form of a chemical substance, but not its composition. Below are some keywords that we use to describe physical changes. Melting, breaking, splitting, shaving, crushing, ripping, cracking, and there's so many others. I save chemical changes for last because I really think that they're the easiest to understand. Let's look at a definition. By definition, really, chemical changes occur when any substance combines with another to form something new. And what we're seeing is when we form something new, it's an alteration to the composition of what we used to have. And really, in order to change something chemically, you must have a chemical reaction that occurs. Take a look at these examples here, and there are so many. Whether it's the iron rusting, or you know, toast burning, or the leaves changing color, or the banana turning brown. Really, there's so many examples of chemical changes. Sometimes they're not so evident and are a little more difficult to see because, in truth, we really can't get down to a molecular level. But if we could, this is sort of what we would see. Let's take, for example, this reaction that we see here. Or this reaction that we see here. 
What we notice in both of these is that if we look at the, this group of atoms here, these are called our reactants, and we look at what we see here after the arrow, and this is really what we refer to as our products, we notice that they are different. This arrow here generally implies that a chemical reaction has occurred. And really what we're seeing is when your products differ from your reactants, you have a chemical change that has occurred. And that's really one of the most important things. What we also find is that the properties of your products will often differ from the properties of the reactants. Take this example that's here. This is sodium hydroxide. It's a really, really strong base, and this is hydrochloric acid, a really strong acid. Both of these you really don't want to touch and mess with, but when you mix them together and a chemical reaction ensues, what we wind up making is essentially an ACL, which you guys know is salt, and we make water. Well, last I looked, we swim in salt water. Some people have swallowed it. We get it in our eyes. It's no problem at all. So the properties of our products after a chemical change can differ from the properties of the reactants. One of the other neat things is that even though we saw that you can undo some physical changes, once you have a chemical change, it cannot be undone. You need to have a chemical reaction to undo a chemical change. It can't be undone by physical means like boiling or something like that. So let's stop the video now and let's check for understanding. Use the notes that you just took and your understanding of chemistry to complete section D on your companion worksheet. You can hit play again and you'll get the answers after our break. Okay, excellent job. This video is finished. So please keep in mind any questions that you may have or note anything that was unclear, and we can certainly hit that during the burning questions segment tomorrow. I look forward to seeing what you guys have learned, and we'll catch you on the flip side. Peace out! That's all, folks.